Therefore, it's time for members' statements. We're from Bruce Gray, one side. We want to hear you first. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last month, I had the honour of joining Peninsula Family Health Team at the Friendship Club in Lion's Head to celebrate Dr. Dave Thompson's 25 years of medical practice on the peninsula. Following a decorated career in the Canadian Navy, Dr. Thompson turned his attention to medicine. He obtained his family medicine specialization in June 1992. Dr. Thompson always likes to tell the story that he received a call from Dr. George Harper in Tobermory in the early summer of 1992, asking him if he was free to lend a hand on the peninsula. Dr. Thompson said sure he could try to help out for a little while, and 25 years later, he is still there. Dr. Thompson opened his medical practice on the peninsula in September 1992. During his medical career, he has been active in many leadership and community roles in support of the provision of exemplary health care for our residents in our community. Now, in his 25th year of medical practice, Dr. Thompson is as busy as ever. He continues to have patient clinic days in both the Lion's Head and Tobermory sites of the Peninsula Family Health Team weekly. He serves as the medical director for the long-term care facility in Lion's Head, provides hospital and emergency coverage at our local rural hospital Lion's Head, provides palliative care home visits, assists monthly with medical surgeries at our regional hospital in Nolan Sound, is a regular preceptor for medical students and residents from four medical school programs in Ontario, and provides physician support to the Tobermory Hyperbaric Facility. Dr. Thompson is the embodiment of a true rural family physician. His practice encompasses entire families in our community, from the youngest grandchild to their great-great-grandfather and everyone in between. Dr. Thompson has made the beautiful Bruce Peninsula his home for over 30 years, where he spends his free time with his wife Jane, daughters Megan and Emma, and his beloved dog, Seamus. I invite the members to join me in congratulating Dr. Dave Thompson on his 25th anniversary of providing medical care on the Bruce Peninsula. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. I want to start out today with a big shout out to the Knights of Columbus in Windsor and Essex County. Twenty years ago, they adopted our local hospice, and they've been raising money for the hospice every year since then. It started with a friend of ours, Mike Aegis. We used to be involved in the Forest Glade Fastball League together. Mike's friend, Bill Fontaine, came down with cancer, and his final days were spent at the hospice. Mike decided to do something to help others going through the same thing. He convinced all of the local councils to get involved, and since then, they've raised more than $300,000 for a hospice. They collected another $8,500 or so on the weekend. Gail and I were honored to spend an evening with these community boosters. The Bishop of London, uh, Ronald Fabro, was there as well. And one of the speakers was Andrew Despens. He said the hospice isn't a place where people come to die. It's much more than that. It's a place where people come to live their final days with the respect and dignity they so much deserve. And Speaker, changing gears as my time is running out, you can't settle a contract dispute unless you're at the table. I'm asking the government to direct the two sides involved with our community colleges to get back to the bargaining table, tell them to sit down and settle this dis dispute. Don't suggest it. Direct them to bargain and do it this week. The students deserve nothing less. Thank you. For the member, Mr. Member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. October the 11th is the International Day of the Girl, and on that day, I hosted a STEM Girls event at Google headquarters in Kitchener, and Speaker, it was a huge success. 80 girls from Waterloo Region schools from grades 5 to 8 attended the event to promote science, technology, engineering, and math. There are many challenging, well-paying jobs in the STEM field, but a smaller portion of women in the sector, and this contributes to a gender wage gap. We know that girls and boys perform equally well in math and science until middle school. For a variety of reasons tied to how the sexes are socialized, we often see girls dropping out of these subjects by high school. Speaker, they need to be encouraged to continue with math and science. So, showing them what a STEM career looks like and role models who are successful in this field is one way to do that. I invited six speakers, all dynamic women in various STEM careers. One produces apps at Google. Another one has a wind turbine tech company. Another is a theoretical physicist. We even had a student there. What followed was a TED Talk style format. The women shared why they chose a STEM career, what they do in their jobs, and what's challenging and rewarding in their sector. The positive feedback that we received from both students and teachers was overwhelming. 
Speaker, it was so encouraging to see girls inspired by the work of these impressive women reminding them that girls can su succeed in STEM. We'll do it again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Further statements, the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to inform the House that on Saturday, October 28th, the famous Canadian ice dance pair Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer, the pride of Ilderton, Ontario, set a new world record score, decisively winning the Skate Canada International event held in Regina, Saskatchewan. I would briefly like to remind this House of the remarkable record of these artists' athletes. Moyer and Virtue are Olympic champions. They are three-time world champions, they are seven-time Canadian champions, and they are the youngest pair ever to win the ice dance competition at the Olympics. This pair has now skated together for 20 years. Both Moyer and Virtue received their earliest training at the Ilderton Skating Club, which continues to be a pillar of the community, thanks in large measure to the dedication of the entire Moyer family. I congratulate Scott and Tessa on this most recent win and look forward to watching the 2018 Olympic ice dance competition, which will be taking place in South Korea. I know we will all be treated to another stunning performance from our great Canadian skaters. Thank you. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Our hospitals are at a tipping point. Some of them are so overcrowded that it is starting to impact quality of care. I'll give you the example of Mr. Graton from my riding. On May 13, Mr. Graton fell ill and went to the emergency room. It was determined that he needed a pacemaker and he had advanced prostate cancer. As his health continued to deteriorate while he was in the hospital, it became clear he needed long-term care. At any other time, he would have been assessed in the hospital and given options to wait his turn for long-term care, but not anymore. In order to apply for long-term care, he had to leave the hospital. It was impossible to care for him at home. He needed 24-hour care, oxygen, a catheter. He needed help with transferring, with feeding. He was transferred to a retirement home with home care. Once at the retirement home, he started to fall, fall out of bed. A few days later, the PSW assigned to his care does not show up. He spent the day unfed, in soil clothes, without his medication. He's now deemed in crisis, allowed to apply for long-term care home. Not surprisingly, he feels ill again. He's sent to the emergency. He now has pneumonia, bladder infection, blood poisoning. His long-term care bed opens up. He is too sick to go to long-term care. Mr. Graton died in hospital last night. His family felt that the overcrowding in our hospital meant that they were too focused on getting him out the door, on clearing a bed. How many other families are treated Thank the you. same way? Further member statements. The member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, and Westdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise to uh, celebrate uh, my alma mater, uh, McMaster University, um, as they open the uh, the new uh, uh, humanities uh, building, the uh, Red Wilson building, the um, 150,000 square foot. Uh, facility. Um, interesting story, two stories behind this. One, of course, is the uh, uh, love and uh, attention and care that uh, Mr. Wilson uh, exemplifies for his alma mater, and to which he's added a $10 million donation. And the other was the uh, support of the students. Uh, the year that uh, the decision was made to fund this facility was one where the government uh, to be, to be frank, had decided not to support any social science or humanities um, uh, infrastructure going to engineering and science. But the students at the uh, university uh, wrote uh, passionate letters to me, I saw over 400, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, reflecting on why, after a 30-year uh, struggle and wait, that this uh, facility was so essential. So for students out there who think from time to time, as I did from time to time when I was a student, that you don't have a lot of influence, you really do have. And the students took charge, and uh, they really own this building. And uh, I'll be there this afternoon to celebrate its opening. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' statements? The member from Chatham Kent, Essex. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Two weeks ago, there were two accidents in Carnage Alley. In the space of only two days, two tractor trailers flew off the road. Before this, there were five crashes in six days, leading up to the 
Thanksgiving weekend. As my constituents tell me, it's sheer luck that no one has been seriously injured in the latest accidents in Carnage Alley. Now, the Premier has had enough time to decide whether her government will take any action to make Carnage Alley safer. But I'm not convinced that this government is taking the danger of Carnage Alley seriously. First, the Premier made a promise in this House to build a barrier. Well, everyone understood that uh, to mean that the cement barrier in my riding was what the, my constituents were demanding. And by the way, Speaker, I have over 4,000 signatures ranging from Windsor to Ottawa demanding that a cement barrier be built. But then the Premier began walking that promise back, and the Transport Minister said he was looking into high-tension cables. Well, cables may be effective against a car, but a large truck would just plow right through them. Winter is coming, and that stretch is extremely hazardous. Transports will inevitably cross over the grass median and end up in the ditch in the opposite direction. Construction is currently taking place there in that very stretch from Tilbury to Chatham, so take the time and build the cement barriers. I want my colleagues here to understand that my constituents and I will not let this matter go. So again, I say we must build a cement barrier now. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, Ottawa South has produced many great athletes. One of the most notable is rugby legend Al Sharon. Just this past week, he was named to the World Rugby Hall of Fame. He has been described as the greatest forward our country has ever produced. He repre represented Canada four times at the World Cup, played with the Barbarians All-Star Squad five times. He played professionally in England and France. He played for Hillcrest High School in the Ottawa Irish and he has never forgotten his local roots. He still calls Ottawa South home, and he continues to be a great supporter of local athletes. Al is humble. He's a gentleman. He credits his successes as team successes, and I know that the member from Nepean Carlton would tell you he was a big part of the Rowan's Law team here in this legislature. He continues to be a tremendous champion for the sport he loves and the athletes that play it. Speaker, I ask that all members of the legislature join me in congratulating Al, a really great guy, in this tremendous achievement. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further members, the famous member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. This uh, past weekend marked the official opening of Veterans Memorial Gardens in St. Thomas. More than 100 people braved the cold and gathered in downtown St. Thomas for the opening. In addition to the general public, the crowd was made up of city officials, members of the Royal Canadian Legion, Lord Elgin Branch 41, uh, members of the Elgin Regiment, Mayor Heather Jackson, Warden Grant Jones, and MP Karen Vecchio. In addition, uh, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Her, Her Honour Elizabeth Dodswell, was there for the opening. The Veterans Memorial Garden Committee, made up of community members, spearheaded the project over the last two years and were able to raise enough money to create the gardens. The hard work the community attributed to over $110,000 raised through their efforts. I want to really thank uh, Herb Warren and his committee for putting this together for the City of St. Thomas and, and County of Elgin. The garden includes the city's boy soldier statue recognizing First World War veterans, the city's Second World War Korean War cenotaph, and a new monument was created recognizing those who served the war in, Afghani in Afghanistan. In addition, uh, Mr. Speaker, a Vimy tree was planted, and a Vimy tree uh, was grown from the acorns from Vimy Ridge brought over to Canada, and we now have one of those in St. Thomas. Uh, the committee felt that this garden made sense because it brought together all the monuments throughout the city to one central location, and the new Veterans Memorial Garden provides the people of St. Thomas with more than just a memorial. There's a park to enjoy, uh, spots to sit and reflect the contributions of brave men and women. And I look forward to the first member of state service occurring November 11th. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank all members for their statements.